Move to approve. Thank you, Richard. Is there a second? Second. I'm a second. Second. Thank you, Heather. Um, we'll now move to approve the minutes by general consent. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. Those aye. opposed, aye. please aye. say nay. Aye. 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 I believe uh, that the minutes are approved and we can proceed with uh, the rest of our agenda of the meeting. So I'll turn it over now to, to Sandy Dak Hirsch. Thank you, John. So our first item for discussion is the potential questions mm -hmm. for the semi-finalist. And first I wanna thank everybody for working in your subcommittees to get us a great list of questions. And today we'll look at those questions in their totality. And we're not wordsmithing so, so much right now. Uh, you know, again, the committees, um, did a lot of that back and forth and 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 you know when we get when we get to the place where we're asking these questions we'll do a lot if we do a, tons of wordsmithing now i guarantee you that when we ask the question the reader of the question is going to do a little bit of interpreting or a little bit of like you know wordsmithing themselves so that it's comfortable when they're saying those questions um when we do have our final list of questions um and we're thinking about um you know how will we um you know, what's, let's think about the order. Um, do they make sense? Are they getting the information that we think we want out of this um, semi-candidate pool? And is there anything that we've left off um, that we think is really important to ask this, this pool? Um, and I think the third thing is, are there things that, in, that, that you feel are redundant that, you know, get at the same thing? And so maybe we need to have a different question. Um, about 10 questions, I think is a good, uh, amount of questions for a semi-finalist interview. Um, the process, you know, once we have this slate of questions and we're um, interviewing the semi-finalist, we'll have people assigned to ask the questions. My past experience has been that um, it's um, more comfortable if you're assigned a question and you ask that question um, all the time, um, but not everybody's gonna ask a question um, with each candidate. So we'll take turns and kind of work in teams. So, you know, team A, team B, team, team C. Um, that doesn't mean that people can't ask follow-up questions, but um, I think it gets a nice cadence. You learn um, how the other person is asking a question and how, they, how you might follow up. And so um, we can talk more about how we'll actually do that once we, um, once we finalize our list of questions for the semi-finalist. Any questions? So I think someone from the board office is gonna bring those, share their screen so we can see the questions. Is this better? Do you want one page at a time? You want to see them overall first, and then we can kind of go one question at a time. Great. <clears throat> Who's ever making those adjustments? We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it big enough for people to see? Not yet. No. A bit bigger. A little bigger, yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so we're <laughs> I know. You're up close and personal to see the <laughs> questions. Um, <clears throat> so should we just read through them first? Okay, yeah, and then come back and have some comments. And I put them in an order that I thought might work, but you know, the order's up for discussion as well. Are you ready to scroll up?
Sandy, this is Jim Lindenmeyer. Is this the order that you're uh, supposing that they would be asked in? Not necessarily, Jim. We just kind of put them in a, you know, first first glance order. Okay. And I don't even, you know, John and I were talking, we don't even know like that, you know, that all the diversity questions need to be together. All the communication questions need to be together. There might be a more logical way to ask these questions given what we have here. All right, should we start with overall impressions? Sandy, this is Jim. I'll just, I'll do the warm up question, I guess. The, right. I, I think these are strong questions. Um, I think some of them will lead to follow-up questions and I think hopefully to things that we can do uh, background checks on too, like that, the very first question answer or asked there. Um, I would recommend that that not be the first question that maybe um, you give them a warm-up question to start with, you know, one where they don't have to discuss their most difficult circumstance right yeah and um, make them a little more comfortable with the, who, whoever's asking the question or whatever that's but I I, I really like the uh, emergence of the topics and uh, they're very behaviorally based for the most part I like that Sandy this is Heather and I I agree with Jim um, I was wondering maybe that that initial warm-up question could be uh, why they applied for this position mm -hmm. or what made them interested in this position? Maybe we could incorporate that with um, an opening statement of their choice that mm -hmm. would include that kind of thing. Yes, that's great. Uh, <clears throat> I, I agree with those suggestions. I think the very first question should be more welcome and yeah. actually giving candidates some time, and it could be shorter, anywhere from two to five minutes to address why they're applying for this position. This is very welcoming as well and would make them more, quote, comfortable. Yeah. Instead of going with a question right away and like, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, thank you. We assigned those topical areas. You're absolutely right. We did not assign anyone for warm up. So, <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> that's a very good point. <laughs> and I, ju I just want to um, speak in support of what was just said in that I, I think an opening question or an opening statement about tell us about yourself and your interests in the University of Iowa are, are really critical before we jump into the actual um, questions right. themselves. Yeah, the way, I mean, I agree with you, uh, Ali, and, and everyone that's made these previous comments. I mean, personally, Sandy and I haven't talked about this in length about who would ask which question and whatnot, but personally, I, I, I would like to see Sandy and I maybe do the opening sort of state, you know, question to them, the welcoming sort of uh, activity, and then have our committee members be the ones that are asking the questions. I mean, you, you know, 
yeah. I, I really applaud the work that all, all of the committees did to narrow their, their interests of questions down to the numbers that we have and the way that they're, the, you know, the narrative is, is articulated here. Um, I, I give you great, great accolades for that. It, it's not a hard or not an easy thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do, actually. Um, but I would, I would like to see the committees who worked so hard on it, the committee members, be the ones asking the questions and Sandy and I sort of doing the, you know, sort of the, 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 uh, the beginning and the, the ending sort of summary activities. That, that's my own personal view, but Sandy and I haven't talked about that at, at length. I think that's a really good idea. The, so the authors of the different sections, you'll rotate asking those right. questions. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and my, my experience with opening and closing is that it's very appropriate and consistent to have the co-chairs do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, Armando, you wanted to say something? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, very briefly, thank you, uh, agree. Uh, would that be a question that <clears throat> they can ask the committee anything they want? Yeah, Just, I think that's a good, yeah. And this could be the close remarks from them. Like, mm -hmm. would you have any questions? Yeah. You, uh, yeah. You, yeah. That shows a lot about <laughs> candidates as well. Yeah. yeah, and you know, that, oh, yeah. that opening statement, and this is sort of where I was going with the, you know, we could do a lot of wordsmithing, but often in the opening statement, somebody will address quite a few of the things or touch on some of the things that we have specific questions about. So the asker will have to amend the question a bit, given that somebody's already answered the question, either fully or partially. So um, I have Joe, David, and then Sue, okay? Paula. I, yeah, thanks, Sandy. Um, I, I could have missed this, so so apologies as I was as I was reading through it. But um, two things that I that I didn't that didn't jump out at me um, that I that I encourage us to think about adding. One, I didn't see anything about um, what this candidate would do to bolster or strengthen our research mission. Um, um, I, I think one of the terms that I really enjoyed from the town halls was you know looking for a leader who's academically ambitious, um, and and that didn't really come through with any of these questions to me. Um, and then the second is I don't see anything here, maybe, maybe a little bit in the DEI one about um, attitudes or principles relating to academic freedom and the value that, that, um, that, that, that the candidate um, has in that, in that space. So uh, maybe something on academic freedom and something on strengthening the research mission would be um, things to consider. Okay, thanks Joe. David, or does anybody have comment back to Joe before we move to the... Good, David. David, yeah. Well, just for what it's worth, I love the idea of folding the first question into a kind of introductory statement. And I wanted to also mention that the, the first leadership question, I think I'm sure everyone noticed this, and the second communication question are very similar. So maybe we could com uh, find a, a version of a question that, that, that hits both of those. Yeah, so maybe, um, I agree, David. So maybe those questions that are pretty similar, we could substitute um, um, questions to, the, to, to Joe's point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. First, I apologize for the chainsaw in the background, <laughs> if you can hear that, but. But I, I appreciate the fact in the questions that we have both some philosophy questions and some action, and maybe leaning heavily or on heavier on action. I also like in the DEI where um, there's a question about, okay, now how do you check your actions? I think that's a good follow-up. I'm not sure if at the moment we're talking about follow-up questions and kind of picking these apart, but um, but I would say that when we're talking about the team, it talks about building the team, but I'd also like to know how someone has maintained their team because we heard a lot about that and a lot about turnover in our listening sessions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, good point, Sue, thank you. Can we scroll down on the questions just to... Mm -hmm. There was one question that I thought was really direct and I, maybe further down. 
Oh, it's, um, do you perceive any drawbacks using shared governance? I, I, I feel like that question is just a yes, no. Um, so is there some way to get, um, is there some way to open that question up a little bit more so there's, it's more open-ended? Maybe adding a how, <laughs> starting with a how. Or, or could you say what, what drawbacks do you see in using shared governance to see if they identify any specifically? Mm -hmm. Or, or something that even asks if they identify drawbacks, um, something about uh, maybe have you had any, not opportunities, but any experiences in which it didn't work with shared governance or where uh, you encountered obstacles trying to incorporate shared governance, some, something of that nature, and then how did you address those? So that would allow them to self identify What I'm looking at is something that they would self-identify that they saw drawbacks to it and then their approach to it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sandy, I was gonna, um, if I could jump in there, this is Anjali. Just uh, with that question, I was thinking about, you know, either are there situations where engaging with shared governance would be a drawback or have you had an experience where working with shared governance, you know, resulted in a drawback? Or, but, but basically give us an experience where either it, it would be difficult to do that or you would not think to do that versus here's an experience where I did it and this is what happened. Yeah. Maybe, Angelia, as I was listening to your word, that maybe backfired as opposed to a yeah, drawback yeah. going into it, but where your engagement with shared governance uh, backfired and how did Perfect. you? I got halfway through that sentence and <laughs> didn't know what the word was. <laughs> I won't <get> sorry. <laughs> so, so can I ask, you know, Joe, Connor, McKinsey, um, people on that committee. We're, so what what is it that you want to draw out of somebody by asking that question? And what do you think about these amendments? Heather, Heather's the other person who's on that committee. This is Connor. I was going to say, and others can definitely jump in. Our goal is to kind of not draw out any red flags in their in their perspective on shared governance, but really get a sense of understanding of how they've used it at other institutions. And if they're going to come in seeing it as a almost a barrier to what they wanna do at the University of Iowa or et cetera. So I, I really like the proposals to say, you know, are there any drawbacks? Have, how have you seen them? How have you remedied, remedied those, et cetera? I think we definitely can tease that out a bit, but our goal is to kind of catch any sort of concerns with the system ahead of time. And I agree with, this is Heather, I agree with um, Connor. I don't know if maybe instead of drawbacks, uh, challenges, might be another option. Or maybe we could um, say, tell us a little more about your experience with shared governance, the drawbacks and positives that you have experienced. This is Connor, I like that idea. Second that, this is Liz. I agree, it's more neutral, it gives both that they can share negative and positive experiences because in reality, there should be both negative and positive experiences. Yeah. Right. That might allow the two shared governance questions to be combined in a way that leaves room for some of the kinds of questions that Joe had suggested about yeah. academic freedom and such. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I'll just add that sometimes the most informative questions are the ones that ask them about their challenges and, ex um, and how they've handled those experiences. And so I really value those. Okay, good. So do we wanna go, do, wanna, do we wanna go to the, to the top and sort of go through them question at a time? Um, or is there some other sort of sticking points or things that just sort of jump out at you that you want to address? 
Um, this is a John, maybe just a point of clarification. Is our, our goal in some sense to build a list of 10 by choosing our favorite ones or are we trying to trim the current list down to 10 or is there a non-arbitrary number? I don't think we there's I don't think we need to trim this necessarily. I don't think we have to okay. get bigger. I think what we have here is a good this is my own personal opinion, John. <laughs> Others can weigh in too. I think that what the committees have given us is are um, really great questions. And I um, again, I don't know that we need to add unless there's something really missing. So for example, the two questions that Joe brought up, um, but if there's ways to consolidate it um, and make it about this length, I think that, um, th that, that that's what I would like to see. Noted. If there is consensus from the committee, I would suggest that you type on here, opening question, Sandra and John. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, well, I'll, I'll make these edits that you've all suggested yeah. and then or John and I will talk about these edits and then give them back to you. Okay. Yep. Uh, John and Sandy, what, what will the venue be like? Is this, will every member of the search committee be involved in the questioning or will you use a circuit type style or how do you envision that? So, so these are the semi-finalist candidates that we would, right, Jim, that's what you're asking about. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if we were in person, this is what people would um, refer to as the airport interviews. And my experience is that the entire committee participates in that process. And we expect that that's the process that we'll use, even though we'll be in a virtual format um, for this for the interviewing of semifinalists here. And so again, I envision that once we have um, this list of questions finalized, that we'll probably work in teams of, I'm guessing three, um, depending on the number of candidates that we have. So everyone is gonna have a chance to ask questions at least once, maybe possibly twice. And we'll try to assign people, not try, we will assign people in the areas of the subgroups that you worked in. But I think it's a, a good, a nice thing for you know you to be in a listening mode and you to be in a questioning mode and so um, while some of the committee members may be asking questions everyone will be present to hear those answers and everyone has the opportunity to follow up or ask for clarification um, that's the way that we'll run the semi-finalist interviews so it will it all be virtual and will anybody the the committee chairs or whomever be in a room or is the candidate at a distance as well? The candidate will be at a distance. So this part will be virtual. That's a good question, Nancy, for the committee You know, members. Will we be virtual or will we have the opportunity to sit in the same room? And I am certainly up for um, a conversation about that. I don't wanna put people into a situation where they're not comfortable, but we envisioned that for sure the candidates are coming in virtually and um, that for the most part, this is a virtual, a virtual um, um, interview process at the semifinalist stage. And I was thinking about that coming in too. You know, John, would we be in the same room, or you know? Yeah, yeah we might want to elaborate or think a little bit more um, carefully about that, Sandy. But I think maybe if it, it might it might show a certain level of um, decorum. I'm, I'm not sure what the right word is that, that you and I are in the same room during the virtual interviews of the semifinalists to do the introductions and sort of the wrap up. And then, um, you know, I'm certainly game if we can find the right, right um, accommodations if other committee members would like to be, you know, face to face with Sandy and I, we can make that arrangement. Or if you're again, more comfortably, comfortable uh, virtually I mean, we have some people who are at quite a distance, obviously, um, you know, our two regions and, and Sue Beckwith, uh, are, you know, are not local residents, obviously. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna ask them to, to come to campus just, you know, for this activity. They're, it's a, probably a, a, a better use of our technology to do these things virtually. But certainly I think Sandy and I could be in the same room as a, a sign of um, respect to the candidate, to the semifinalists, and also uh, the importance of the event that the the two co-chairs are, are physically present together um, during this particular activity. In a non-COVID um, time, our, we actually conducted our um, Dean search virtually. 
the candidates were all virtual. The, the team was in a, the committee was in a, in a, um, the same room. Um, and it worked really well. And I know that the chief nursing officer um, interviews over at UIHC were just completed and they did the semifinalist round virtually and then brought the finalist and onto campus into the hospital. And again, it worked well. They felt that the process worked well. Just as an aside, John, I'm happy to come over. I miss coming over three times a week for basketball games. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so noted, Sue. Thank you very much. I'm, I know I'm, you know, cognizant of the of the fact that you know more and more people are being vaccinated too. So people's comfort levels are going to change between now and you know a month from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But normally this would be the airport one where we'd all be going to someplace. That's right. So That's right. Right. Joe, thanks. Uh, yeah, if, if we're still, if we can still make comments on, as, I'm, as I'm working yeah. through this, I'm trying to compare the, the questions with um, some of the qualities we, we put in our job description and, and two more things kind of jumped out at me. Um, and again, apologize if I missed something. I've only seen part of the, part of the questions, but I don't see anything that really probes um, fiscal um, strategy or experience with um, budgetary or financial matters. Um, and, and I realize that we have a limited amount of time with these candidates. So um, again, if anyone thinks these are too granular, please please let me know. Um, but, th but that struck me as, as one. And then, uh, and again, this might, again, be a little granular, but um, I heard a lot during the town halls, and I see it in our job description about balancing the uh, promoting and advancing the arts and humanities, the liberal arts, and the the more the harder sciences and, and the medical um, um, structure. So, um, you know, one thing I'd be interested in trying to to tease out from candidates is kind of where they where they see those um, major components of the university working together, uh, fitting together to, to strengthen the overall um, institution. So to me, Joe, that like, you know, I'm going back to the ad, the, um, how do you bolster the research mission? Maybe we not have that so narrow, but make that to, to, to your point here that, you know, this campus is a multifaceted campus with um, arts, humanities and other things and, 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 um, and address the question that way is to see sort of how they talk about those kinds of things. Yeah, because we, we want all of those things to advance on campus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I really like that. Thanks, Amy. I, I agree. And I think if we go, I think it's the last leadership question or vision question we ask about the healthcare because we wanted to make sure we included that as a component. Mm -hmm. And we might be able to broaden that question to ask about, you know, recognize that the institution ha is multifaceted, as Sandy said, has the research, has the solid um, liberal arts, humanities and the healthcare campus. How do you balance the three of them and then maybe add in a little bit of experience with healthcare? Great point, Joe. And I like the research on this too. I'm wondering, <clears throat> Armando here. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. I, I second your uh, uh, suggestion. I'm wondering in the introduction, if we could ask specifically for them to talk about those. Uh, having the opportunity to introduce themselves and perhaps the vision that would include the humanities, the arts, the healthcare, etc. Like a way of uh, introducing a question to them at the same time, let them talk freely about those three things. And then at the end, as Teresa just suggested, then bring it back as a conclusion, you know, and be more specific about it. I don't know if it made sense what I'm trying to say, but anyway. No, no, I think okay. I understand your point. I'm on yeah. <clears throat> Give them some <laughs> topics. <laughs> Give yeah. them some topics in the introduction. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then the vision at the end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, this is David. So I think that sounds fine. I, I just think that uh, in case the opening question is often intended to be a kind of uh, softball to, to get things started. We, we would want, I think, as, uh, as folks are suggesting, to make sure that the vision uh, question at the end includes specific reference to some of the things Joe had described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's benefit to leaving it really open at, at the beginning, right? Because you get a feel from sort of what the candidate is thinking rather than us telling them what to think about. And so, um, yeah, yeah. This is Sue Beckwith. I, I like your statement about being open because my concern when we started talking about uh, individual areas or programs is that it would exclude others and it's not inclusive enough of all areas. And so I like to start to get specific about talking about areas. Yeah. I'd rather leave it open. Yeah. Because you, you yeah. will, it, you know, if we sort of again stay sort of in that. Um, it's a multifaceted university with many things. How do you balance the, your attention to the th these things and promote the, you know, these things within the campus? We would hope that the person has done their homework. And so if we tell them that these things are <laughs> important and they've not done their homework to figure this out by looking at the things that we've given them, you know, that's a red flag. Uh, the if you have any questions for us also <laughs> illustrates that quite well if yeah. they have done their research yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i like that addition a lot yeah that's a great suggestion armando others do you want to go to again oh i'm sorry i i don't feel like we finished the answer to the fiscal question, do we want mm -hmm. anything about uh, their administration, administrative history, um, anything from running a big business, <laughs> which this is to do uh, um, raising money and all of those things. We haven't touched upon that at all. Yeah, yeah. Your experience with budgeting, fundraising, all of those, I think those are very important questions, yeah. Seems like that could be a combined question, sort of a money financial question. Right, right. A quick question about process, um, just with regard to, so these are the questions that we're going to ask of the semi-finalists. And from this, we're then going to move to a set, a smaller set, obviously, of finalists. And so, at, do we ask more detailed questions, like some of these things that are coming up about specific programs and so on in this round and again in the next round? Or is this more like these are the big items that we have in front of us? These are kind of the screener questions. And if you pass these things, then later we're going to ask you all those detailed questions. Yes, exactly. At this point, um, we are really trying to keep people um, in the, yeah. in the pool, we're trying to keep the pool big, right, and open. And so this is our, you know, chance to do exactly what you've just said, Angelique. You know, our, I'm interested in this person. They've really, I want to bring him into campus and we're going to get down into the, you know, brass hacks now. And, you know, we're going to cross, we're going to have a time, to, you know, to get into sort of the more detail. They will be meeting with people on campus who will get into those detailed areas of the campus that they're experts in. Um, and so, yeah, here we don't want to, you know, it is our, it, so it, it is our, um, you know, job to get a semifinalist pool, but you don't want to narrow it too narrow. So, yeah. Yeah. So I just wondered if like some of the nuances we would save <laughs> until next time. Yeah. And remember, we will have, you know, their, their CVs and they will have some type of statement that they, that they um, have as I, Right, Jim and Janice, they have a statement that they will prepare. And so those materials are things that we will be looking at in this stage in order to say, yes, I want to move someone. I want to move somebody forward. And then just one last question. I might have missed this. Um, how much time do we have with the candidates? So when we are setting up this virtual call or meeting with them, how much time will we have to go through these questions? 
You know, Angela, so part of that will depend on how many candidates, you know, we think that we want to yeah, have. Um, and so we will have um, a meeting that's, called, you know, that we're going to get into sort of next steps here in a second, but we'll have what's called the paper cut. So we have everybody in the pool and we're going to narrow that pool down to the semifinalist. And then once we know how many people are in that um, semifinalist pool, that'll help determine how long we have with each person. And even we might go back to our list of questions and say, oh, you know, and I think this is too long for the number of people that we have coming in, or we have a little bit more time, so maybe we'll ask a few more questions. Um, but it's about an hour, hour, 70 minutes. So it, that, that I've, is, is my experience with, you know, on Dean and Provost search that we have with each candidate. John, do you have other, I mean, other people have been on committees too. Yeah, I, in my experience on, on, on search committees, you know, for the, the semifinalists, whether they're off campus or well, everyone I've been involved in has been an off-campus airport interview. Um, yeah, 75, no long, certainly no longer than an hour and a half. Yeah, again, that's gonna, Angelie, we'll, again, we'll talk about that in next steps and it's, because we're gonna provide some, um, you know, a, a, a pretty strong suggestion for a time frame of, of how things are gonna unfold here soon. But again, depending upon how many candidates we wanna bring in as semifinalists, that might sort of, give us an idea of what length of time we would have with each individual and then the number of questions um, that we have to ask them. But I would say, you know, 75-ish is probably a good, good way to think about starting that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my experience cer certainly no longer than 90 minutes. Um, it's, 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 uh, a, that's a long time for, the, for the, the, uh, uh, the people being interviewed and it's a long time for the committee to interview and, and pay attention as well, quite frankly. So, um, 75 is a really good target to start with, I think, 75 minutes. So are we good with the, the list of questions with John and I going back and doing some of the tweaking and then send it back? Or is there something else that you want to spend some time with before we move into the next steps? Sandy, I just wanted to echo a point that Jim made early on that, that a lot of the questions are behavioral and invite the candidates to be specific. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, David. I think that yeah, I'll echo what John said. I mean, I think the subcommittee work was stellar and we've got a great, I mean, I really like that people are pulling from our, you know, our, our, our um, leadership characteristics are coming from the listening visits. They're reflected in the, that's reflected in, in the leadership characteristics. We're going back to that to formulate these questions. And I think that's, that's a you know, huge strength of, of, of what we're doing here. One thing that I've thought about, and I'm wondering if you can or cannot even ask any questions surrounding the um, spouse of a person. Um, and their involvement in the campus. Uh, it's such a positive when they're a team and really um, the spouse is very much involved in, in campus life and whatever. And, but I don't know, maybe we can't ask those questions. No, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Is there any way I, I've thought about that as well. So if that comes up, I have been assured that um, if the candidate brings it up, um, you know, um, and especially when we're bringing people into campus or they're, you know, that, you know, we have the means to be able to make sure that the spouse is connected to and with people that they might need to see as the candidates come to campus. And Nancy, I have been in interviews where um, the candidates have brought their spouse into the conversation to communicate their team work and approach and address the question you're asking so we can listen for it but we can't yeah, ask it but we can't ask it right yeah i think this is personal right it's supposed not to yeah right. you know i guess Nan or Sandy, this is Amy from the board office. I have yeah. that chart of 
certain topics or areas that the committee should not probe into when interviewing the semifinalists. I will share that with the committee. I think it it's a good, simple explanation of areas that you can probe into and areas that you should try to avoid. But I do agree that you can be active listeners because it's not prohibited for the candidates to um, voluntarily bring up some information. We just can't uh, ask solicit more information if that occurs. Thank you, Thank you Amy. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great to share with the committee. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Kay, Kay I see your hand up. Um, I don't, I can't see the shared governance questions at the moment and I don't need to, need to look at them directly, but one of the things I wanna make sure is, is asked somewhere, I, I was part of the leadership question team. Uh, the balance between shared governance and understanding that this person will be the final decision maker, that the buck will stop with them. So I'd, I'd like a little bit of flavor to that point as you redraft these questions. Okay, good point. This is Connor. I was just gonna ask to go back to this section as well too. I was, I was thinking it'd be good for us to ask how would they establish shared governance at the University of Iowa? I know when presidents come in, they have a tendency to kind of redefine it and kind of set boundaries, whether it's, you know, meeting with the four presidents or a university senate or et cetera. So it'd be good to see how they would picture doing it upon their appointment. So just a thought. Mm -hmm. So Connor, would you rather see something like that than can you share, can, can you tell us what shared governance means to you and how you would specifically engage or be more specific there? How would you specifically engage? I mean, I, I kind of think we're getting at that. How would you establish shared governance? Uh, that's a good point. I think that I didn't even notice that. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. I appreciate that. That makes sense. I think defining the the boundaries of it would be good. And I don't know if we add that into the number one or we make it a separate question, but. Yeah, there's a communication question too about making decisions. So, right, we had, we talked about this in the communication team too. So how do you make decisions? But what if that decision needs to be made, you know, quickly? Um, how would that change your decision-making process? And that might get at this. Um, while we have shared governance, there's, times that, I mean, you are the decision maker and you have to make things, you have to make a decision. So how are you gonna do that? So maybe it comes out there, okay, but we have a follow-up question in case it doesn't in somewhere in here, right? That talks about that um, kind of longer decision-making process versus one that needs to be made more immediate. Or, but I don't know that that's quite getting at what you're, you know, I'm, I'm <clears throat> what you were conveying, because it's kind of like, you know, the buck stops here kind of thing that you're talking about. Okay. Could you scroll back up to the shared governance questions, please? Or the, maybe it was the one even, the page up. There we go, thank you. The communication one. Yeah, that yeah, the communication was. Thank you. Yeah, so it's number two. Yeah, I think I'm getting at something slightly different than what if the decision needs to be made quickly. I think it goes towards getting all kinds of input, digesting it and so forth. And you have to make the call with regardless of all the input that you get, whether you agree with the general consensus or not, um, you have to choose. And how would you do that? What, how have you done that? <clears throat> okay. Okay. 
Yeah, again, somebody might answer that question that way, but if they don't, we want, you, you would like to see an opportunity to be able to draw that out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Angeli. Um, I guess my question is how, how much can these um, areas overlap? So for instance, I was on the DEI committee and one of the things that we talked about, but is not in these questions that we asked was around DEI as it relates to the formation of the cabinet or you know, provosts and deans and so on. And so up above in the leadership question, it asks about you know, how will you determine if you have the right people in the right roles. So if, do we have the opportunity then to say, you know, how does DEI fit into your vision of this? I mean, like, do, are we just gonna ask the question sort of in these categories or is there some sort of mixing of, of topics if it comes up or if it makes sense to follow up? Or should we have that like laid out so that <laughs> we're asking everybody, you know, obviously the same thing. Yeah, we do have to ask everybody the same thing in terms of like, you know, the, the main questions, but you don't, again, you want, you want some freedom of conversation because you want this candidate to be showing them, you know, who they are. And so, you know, I, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning, you know, some of these questions will be answered out of order, right? They'll, they'll, mm -hmm. Parts of these things will be answered when somebody asks the question. And so, you know, we'll have to be, again, skilled listeners and say, you know, they've really answered this. So I might ask for clarification or to them ex to expand a little bit more because they've answered it partially. Um, but anybody has, all of us on the committee have the opportunity to do follow up with people. And, you know, um, the candidates are going to answer these differently. And so you might, we might be getting more about some topic from one candidate versus another candidate. And, and I really do think that that's okay. What we are doing is making sure that these STEM questions are asked consistently to everybody. Right. Yeah, I agree. And again, it's going to depend on how the, you know, the individual candidates answer certain questions. And again, being active listeners, to their answers, I mean, will give us the ability to sort of uh, audibleize, you know, as the case may be on, on adjusting our questions at the right timing to keep probing a particular issue that on how they answer the question. So you raise a great point, you know, Anjali, we'll have to be very active listeners and, and carefully tease out how we can interject another question into an answer that they provided for perhaps a different question. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, I've been on search committees where people just sort of wrotely ask the question and the candidate yeah. has already answered it. It's really yeah. awkward. Yeah, it's kind, of, so it's kind it's, of boring, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really, you know, I, I, I think it's better when we say, you know, you, you, I haven't, you know, hello, my name is Angelia. I have this next question. I think you've really answered it, but I want to give you the opportunity to go into more detail or, you know, I might want to follow up with something a little bit more specific. Yeah. yeah. Liz has a comment or question. Yeah, I just wanted to know, will there be a mechanism in place um, to just make sure that we're able to get to all of the questions um, and to make sure that the candidates have time at the end uh, to be able to ask their questions? So I just didn't know if there was a time limitation on it because these are all very you know, significant questions and depending on how long the candidate decides to go, um, to talk, you know, we just want to make sure we don't run out of time. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a job for Sandy and I as well. Um, if we're sort of the introducers and the con concluding sort of question people, and you guys are asking the questions, um, I think it's you know our job, Sandy and I's job, to make sure that the conversation keeps moving along, not to cut people short in their answers, but to um, again give us. Uh, uh, you know, each of you an opportunity to ask the questions that we that we have prepared and also for the candidates in all fairness to try to answer all the questions that we have as well to be as consistent as possible from candidate to candidate. So, so I view that as Sandy and our job to sort of be the observers of the time as it were as we're moving along through the, the questions with each candidate. So I've, I've been on um, search um, committees where the um, 
committee chairs have, you know, during the welcoming, they orient the candidates and say, you know, we have this many questions to answer and or we, we will ask this many questions. And we have this much time. And so, again, part of this is assessing the candidates to their time management, and their ability to convey um, what they want to say. Um, sort of concisely and in a timely manner. And, you know, to me, again, that's pretty telling of a candidate who might um, monopolize the entire, they know they have 75 minutes and never move off the first or second question. Um, you, you know, that again, that's part of the interview, understanding their communication style and, and their ability to be able to, you know, again, be concise and answer questions thoroughly. Great. You know, Should so we go into the next step? Oh, sorry, David. I mentioned just one last thing. It's that our, I, was, I was on the DEI subcommittee and for question two, our, our committee uh, thought that maybe there could be some reference to free speech uh, in, in the question. Yeah. The question's about a pervasive belief that a candidate might encounter that diversity and excellence are in conflict. And the thought is that uh, sometimes folks uh, find a tension between free speech and diversity. And I just wanted to at, just ask the larger committee uh, for purposes of helping uh, Sandy and John to craft the question, uh, sh should there be some way that free speech is incorporated into that question or, or, or anybody have strong feelings about that? Is this where we could get some free speech academic yeah. um, and DEI? I mean, Joe brought that comment up before too. Right. Right. We may be able to meld those together, David, in some fashion. That will require some careful thinking on our part, but. Well, and I'll bring it back to the committee, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We just want to say what to do. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good. Regent Becker, your hand's raised. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's really important to, yeah. to address that. Yeah. Thank you. Sue? So. Thank you. This is a very general question, but my experience with this type of thing is actually more giving oral boards where yeah, I have a deadpan face the entire time. <laughs> I'd just be interested in comments about the demeanor of the committee members and, you know, head nodding and, you know, looks and so on. Can you expand on that just a little bit? I only expand upon it in my own experiences. So if somebody, if there's like a, if there's a protocol to this, I'm not aware of it. But my experience in the dean and provost searches that I've been on is that um, we're you're we're trying to be as genuine as possible. That it's a serious interview, but we're also being welcoming to people who are. Um, you know, in that situation of being interviewed. So I've never been in a situation so where people were told not to um, nod their head in agreement or not to give feedback. And um, I, I, I would think it would be really hard to be that sterile in this situation. I understand in boards, I think where that's happening, you're not wanting to give anybody an indication, are they, you know, answering the question correctly or incorrectly. But um, I think here we're really trying to draw people out. We're trying to have a conversation. And if we're not receptive or we're not giving indications that we're here actively listening and hearing and um, um, wanting to converse with them, that it makes it difficult for the candidate to be able to talk. That's my own personal thoughts about that. But other, again, others have been in these situations. Teresa, you have your hand up? Yes, my understanding is that it, to some extent we're recruiting the individual as much as they are um, applying for the job. Because, so we don't want to alienate somebody who might be a good candidate by being too sterile or off-putting. So I've always been as, well, it's part of my, I, I don't play poker, um, but I, I think it's just natural, as Sandy says, is how I've approached such situations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah others have been in that. Yeah, this is Nancy. Can you? Mm -hmm. Am I on? Um, when we have a shared screen, it's really hard to kind of see how everybody else is. Will we not have a shared screen so that we can see the whole gallery? 
when we're doing this. Oh yeah, yeah, we would have a gallery so we could see everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we won't have it. They won't be giving a presentation. This will be a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Armando. Yes, very briefly. I, I think it's important that we also show how excited we are in being in their presence. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know this is a, a, a very challenging task. At the same time, when you get to a point of being a semi-finalist, that means that we are interested in that person and there is something positive about it. By that, I'm not saying we should agree with everything or demonstrate any feelings, but I think they should get that, especially virtually, how excited the committee is about listening and hearing them. Yeah. Uh, and not exactly the other way. It's not, it's not like confrontational or doubting. I don't know. It's, I think it makes a lot of difference as well in how they may perceive our uh, attitude as a committee yeah. overall. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. just, I just want to put it that. Yeah. Ali, Ali, you were involved in the last presidential search. Do you want to share a little bit about your experiences in the semi-finalist interviews? Yeah, so with respect to the semi-finalist interviews, I mean, I think I shared with both, to both you and John the questions that we use. Um, it, it's very much in the way that uh, we just, uh, we've been describing the, the format that we're going to have here. We had everyone around the table at the airport interviews. Um, one thing that we did was to set up the um, interviews so that everyone had assigned questions and asked the same question every time. Um, the intent of that was for, um, the, the purpose of that was to uh, have um, consistency in terms of how each of the candidates were treated. Um, we held very closely to the amount of um, time we held very closely to the amount of time that um, each candidate was allowed. So we wanted to make sure that in terms of time allocation, everybody was treated very equally. And so for that reason, they were held to 30 minutes um, a, a time. And we didn't, we, we were trying to be very rigid to make sure that in terms of fairness, every candidate was having that. For that reason, um, when, when we had the questions, we were trying to allocate time for each of the questions that was um, set and prescribed so that each of the candidates were treating it in a similar way. Um, we did do an opening question and a closing question um, with the co-chairs taking the lead on those. Um, and the other thing is with respect to the questions um, that the, the committee was allowed to, each of, the, each of the committee members were allowed to pick the questions that were their preference in rank order. And so uh, people, uh, amongst the committee were really asking the questions that they had sort of expressed a preference for, even though it was the same question every time throughout. Um, and I would say that uh, there were some questions about challenges as well as uh, their strengths, just to probe their ability on how they dealt with those challenges. Uh, and um, we did end the, the, the overall session with giving them an opportunity to cover any topics that they might want to present to us that had not come through on questioning as well, um, but all within the limited time frame that was presented. So I, I don't know if I've asked, answered all the questions that you were looking for or if there was something more specific that you were looking for, because I, I could certainly elaborate on, uh, on any specifics. No, I think that was really helpful just to give people a feel for, you know, how this would go and what it, how, it'll be very similar to what you just did, what, what you just described. And I think, again, you've already worked in your subgroups. And so I'm assuming that those are the questions that you're, um, that you'd like to ask because you signed up for those subcommittees. So. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I like that, you know, giving them a, a chance to, you know, any sort of closing remarks. I, I have been in a situation where we've given people a chance to have a closing remark and it's gone on a little bit too long, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the, the co-chairs were responsible um, for largely keeping the, the, the candidates in time or on time. And 
um, a, a part of the reason for trying to maintain the allocation of time for each candidate was to ensure that there was equity in, in terms of how they were being treated across the board. Yeah, that's yeah. been my experience Good too. That the interview, the total time of the interview is the same for everybody. Right. Again, we've sort of, my experiences was that we let people know that we have this much time and these many questions to ask. And so we move forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I was did you say let something. them know? Did you let them know, like individually, you have five minutes to answer the first question, or something like that? We we get we we told them that um, we have this many questions, and this is the time allocated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Please take this into account when providing your responses, yeah. and and that was you know it wasn't so much being restrictive to each individual question, but to sort of give them a gauge of the the overall number of questions and the overall time that was going to be available. Nice. Good, good ideas, Ali. Ali, did they have a clock visible to them or did they have to check their watch repeatedly or their phone? Or I just, I'm thinking timing, I have no sense of time. Yeah, so that's a really great question. I don't recall there being a clock, but I do recall there being a staff member that was helping to give signals for timing during the, the interviews so that they had a gauge of when, when, when things were going to be um, coming close to wrapping up. Um, in the vice president for research search um, that I chaired, um, we, uh, as the chair, I, get, I, I kept the clock and gave them an indicator when there was about five minutes left so that they um, knew about timing and um, when they needed to sort of be getting ready to complete their questioning. And, and that, so it could either be staff or it could be the co-chairs that helped to monitor time. Very good. So I don't want to stifle any question or any further conversation about the questions and sort of the general format of how we will do this, but uh, we do have some other issues to uh, bring to your attention today and get your input on. Um, uh, are there any last questions about uh, the, the overall questioning activities? I think Nancy has a comment. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Nancy. I'm sorry. I saw it. No, I just saw your hand now. I'm sorry. I forgot to lower my hand before, so maybe you just thought I was hanging out. But <laughs> um, anyway, I've been uh, sitting here trying to think um, relative to airport interview that I was with on uh, for the Iowa State search. Uh, what would we be missing? And I think, uh, and I just asking to see if there's some way that we can have compensate for this. We, when the candidate gets up to leave the room in an airport, they go around and visit with each member of the committee a little bit. A lot is learned um, by those just short encounters, um, looking in the eye, doing how they, did they do their homework? Do they know something about you? A lot of them knew something personal about each one of us and that showed a lot of caring and a lot of homework uh, done. Um, is, there, is there any way that we can <laughs> facilitate something similar or not? I'm not thinking of anything myself and I'm, I, I, I'm thinking that was a relatively valuable time. Yeah. I'll just add that for the UI search last time around, I don't think we had the same experience of the personal conversations at the end of each round. Um, but what they did do was to go around and shake hands with a number of the members. I'm not sure that the shaking hands thing was going to happen um, this time around anyway because of a, the pandemic. Oh, right. <laughs> Forgot about that. <laughs> okay. Last quick question. Could we defer to our to the experts, our search firm members, and ask them how they have seen accommodations being made for the platform that we're having to use this time? That's a good that's that's good. a good idea. Because they have been in they have been doing these virtually for the last year. <laughs> so good point, Kate. Jim Rodder Janice. So I'll start and uh, uh, Janice and Jim can certainly add uh, what we have done 
uh, primarily are virtual interviews. Uh, what John said earlier in terms of about an hour and a half block per candidate. Uh, typically, most of our clients have had about eight semifinalists. Uh, we've worked that over a two-day span. Uh, some clients have had four each day. Others have had five and then uh, three, where then they leave time at the end of the second day to have the conversation. But typically, about an hour to an hour and 10 minutes is taken for questions, with about 20 minutes of that slot then left for the candidate to ask questions of the, um, of the committee. But as I said, uh, just about, I'd say 90% have been done virtually uh, for the last year. And that is because of you know, COVID and all of the different uh, CDC requirements. And, and naturally, uh, I think in addition, because a lot of the uh, candidates uh, have some concerns about traveling. So we've been able to work very, very comfortably with the Zoom technology it's set up very much the way uh, this is uh, with, with everyone you know, kind of being seen. What many institutions have done um, is to block out all of the search committee except those that are asking questions so that it's not quite as intimidating. A uh, candidate can kind of look at the person asking the question and talk directly to them. It becomes a little bit more personal, but I think Sandy made a comment early on that I just want to underscore. Uh, this should be as conversational as it can be. Uh, because that's how it would occur if the person were face to face. I would caution against some of the follow up questions that were being uh, referred to because you want this to be a level playing field. So you want all the candidates to be asked the same set of questions. And you don't want to deviate from that set of questions. Uh, if the question is directly related to the content, so let's say a person didn't answer the question and you were to say now, you know, the second part of that question was X, Y, and Z, could you just speak to that? As long as it's directly related to the, to the question, to the content of the question, that's okay. But it shouldn't deviate uh, based on what, what, what the candidate is, uh, is presenting. So let me stop there and let uh, Janice and, and, and Jim comment as well. Well, there's not much more to add, uh, at least regarding that question specifically about how we are operating now. We do mimic as much as possible what, uh, what occurs in person yes. uh, virtually. In including um, demeanor, someone yes. spoke about that, comportment, um, attention, uh, nodding and smiling, being inviting, being warm, being welcoming. Um, this is Jim, I would just add that the two co-chairs are going to have to manage this uh, time thing because some candidates might get wound up and, and go too far. Yep. And so just be tough in the sense that we need to move along to 15 other questions. Now, so I think, I think you can give the signal, but if they can't stay on schedule, that tells you something about them that probably isn't positive. But I think the co-chairs just have to manage this in a pretty direct way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and manage our, our own committee members as well. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, there's timing and, and response. And, and we will tell, typically we, we will tell the individuals being um, interviewed that they will, that all of the committee members are present. There will be 10 questions and you will be asked uh, to um, ask your own questions um, at, at, the, at the end. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they know how to balance that time and response. And, and, and Janice, I think also, uh, and this would be for, uh, you know, the, the, the entire committee uh, and Sandy and John in, to, in terms of who you assign the questions to, uh, what you don't want to pick up on what Janice said, and I hope you can see me now, I'm looking down, reading the question. You'd rather be looking right at the camera so that you're looking at the candidate. Mm -hmm. And so you want to memorize that question and yeah. just say, um, uh, John, I have, you know, the next question is mine and that question is, and you just say it. So it's like you're talking to the person instead of looking down, kind of reading it. Yeah. And that's what you don't yeah. want to do is to sort yeah. of make this kind of staccato question, yeah. answer, question, answer. You just want it to be smoother. So there's a natural flow into your question and then to the response. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's why I like that, you know, people are assigned questions. We'll always ask those questions. And Rod, I appreciate your, um, um, follow up on the sort of probing questions that you know exactly yeah. they need to be on topic it's not you ask a follow-up question because you have a different question but it's a clarification it's yes. to 
they didn't answer it completely or they left something, you, you know, they were going to maybe go someplace and you want to draw them back out. But yes. Yeah. This is Heather and I, I do have a question. Um, I'm assuming that you guys are more speaking to the semifinalists yes. in regards to this, the virtual environment. What have you guys been practicing when it comes to campus interviews or are there, is there campus interviews with your clients? Oh, yeah. oh, what right, does right. that look like? All over the map, all over the map. Heather. So, okay. so let me give a couple examples and, and then again, I'll ask my colleagues. So I'm just gonna give you two examples, two different institutions. One institution for the finalist, uh, which which I thought worked pretty well. They brought in the the all of the finalists, uh, you know, on consecutive days, uh, and then the first meeting of the day, the candidates met face to face with the board of trustees. These were presidential searches. The candidate met with the board of trustees face to face. Everybody was socially distanced, um, and so the board got to ask questions. The balance of the time was done virtually. So the candidates stayed in the conference room, they had a big screen. And so a group of faculty got a chance to interact, a group of students, a group of you know, staff, uh, community folks, et cetera. I mean, they did everything else virtually, but they also left time for the candidate to do a tour of the campus. So the two things that were picked up by the face-to-face, -face, I, mean, I mean, by the in-person was that the candidate got to meet with the board face-to-face -face, and the candidate got a chance to, 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 to um, uh, walk the campus to get a feel for what the campus was all about. But all of the other folks had a chance to interact virtually with the candidate. Now, I, I had another situation where the client was just adamant. This, everything has to be done face-to-face. -face. So all of these, all of the sessions were done face-to-face. -face. The, the interview, uh, the uh, tour was done face-to-face. -face. Everybody was socially distanced. There were masks and all those kinds of things. Uh, it worked. I was scared to death. I'll be honest with you because that was back in November uh, when things were still uh, not quite uh, as they should be, but it worked. So, so, and then we've had others where they've been done totally virtually because the, the client didn't want any of the candidates to travel. So everything was set up and done virtually. So what we try to say is if, if you have a sense of how you wanna do it, we will work closely with you to try to make that occur. The key to it, the key to it will be your candidates. If somebody has some underlying conditions or those kinds of things and just doesn't feel that he or she can travel, that might set up an uneven situation if you have one candidate who says he or she can't travel and the other candidates can travel. So I just put that out there on the front end, but, but I think we could, we could work with you in, in any way you wanted to do it. So we've had them all. We've had face-to-face, -face, we've had hybrid, and we've had virtual. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have nothing to add, but of course with a campus visit, whether it is um, combined or, or in person or all virtual. It, it really is, so much of it is your planning. Yeah. We'll, we'll help as we can, but, but uh, it's your kind of guide into knowing your population. So John, maybe we should, this is sort of a natural segue into the, yeah. to the, <laughs> to yeah, the next, next topic. topic. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let us uh, give you an update on some of the things that we, Sandy and I have worked with uh, to come up with um, the next steps in our search. So, I mean, Karen, would you put up the um, proposed presidential search timeline that we have developed? Sure will. Thank you so much, Karen. Can you see it? Yes, thank you so much. So um, Sandy and I have worked um, again internally with um, others on campus to come up with this notion of um, a timeline. And let me let me walk through this and give Here, you some, can blow it up just a little bit, Karen. Yeah, some background on how we came to this sort of approach. Um, when we started the conversation this morning, someone said, "Oh, well, we haven't met very often. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, we're, we're going to be coming up. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of work that uh, all the committee members are going to have uh, coming up, starting in just a couple of weeks, actually. So the the deadline for um, applicants for best consideration, as we've articulated uh, many times, is March 15th, which is um, a Monday, I believe. Yes, it is. Um, and then on <clears throat> when that's all compiled, then the next day on the 16th, Tuesday, March 16th, um, we will have access um, to the portal that AGB has compiled that'll have all of the candidates' um, application materials for us to start taking a look at. Um, what we'd like to do and what we're proposing is that. Um, Friday, March 26th, 
would be an all day meeting of the, uh, again, closed because we're looking at, uh, as I understand it, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, because we're looking at candidates, eval you know, uh, application materials to do our self uh, evaluation of uh, basically personnel files to narrow it down to the appropriate number of semifinalists that we think are appropriate to uh, bring to our paper cut um, um, activity. Now, the rest of the, the um, timeline is based somewhat on the number of uh, semifinalists that we believe we might be bringing um, into the into picture, into consideration, and then the number of finalists. So again, we have some, we have some religious holidays coming up too that will enter into our perspectives, um, but we're looking at, um, so, so we'll meet the 26th to come up with um, what we believe to be the number of semifinalists we'd like to bring. Um, into consideration. And then um, we'd like you to start reserving the following days for uh, the virtual semifinalist interviews. And this may be adjusted depending upon the number of people we decide on. So those would be Thursday, April 1st, um, Friday, April 2nd, and Saturday, April 3rd. So again, that's gonna depend on how many people we de determine to be semifinalists and, and the number of people that we would like to interview each day. So that, that, that would likely get adjusted some way in some manner, depending upon the number of semifinalists. But we'd like you to start reserving on your calendars as much as possible those three days. Um, then we will come down to um, a number of finalists that we'd like to bring to campus and some sort of hybrid mechanism that is, um, we're still working on that to be quite honest, but we've developed the following um, calendar that um, if, if we have four finalists, we'd like to bring in the first candidate um, on April 12th and 13th, um, we would delete that one if we only have determined that we have three finalists. The next finalist um, series dates would be the 15th, 16th, Finalist number three on April 19th, 20th, which is a Monday, Tuesday. And then uh, the, the last finalist on April 22nd, 23rd, which is a Thursday, Friday. We'd like to complete the on-campus interviews by that date to allow then us to have sufficient time to seek uh, input from the campus um, through a Qualtrics survey that we would distribute broadly to campus and get feedback um, back to the committee. Um, we would then like to um, get together, well, we'd have a deadline of um, the 27th of April, which is uh, Tuesday, I believe. And then on Wednesday, the 28th, we would have a search committee to compile feedback from the surveys and um, provide that information to the Board of Regents for their consideration. Um, we would then meet with the board to present this information to them on either Thursday, the 29th or Friday, um, April 30th. The board would then meet um, with the candidates um, and come to their decision on who they would like to um, name the new president of the University of Iowa. Um, that is the time frame that we are working on. We know it's very ambitious, that it, it is very um, time consuming for us, for all of you to uh, dedicate your time to um, both, you know, the, the first cut, the reviewing all the applicants our semi-finalists um, interviews, as well as the finalists. Um, but, um, you know, again, everyone on our committee is, is busy in their own, their own activity on the campus, both students, faculty, and staff. But we'd like you to start um, penciling in or devoting these dates to, uh, to your calendars um, right now. Um, and we would adjust them accordingly, depending upon, again, the number of semi-finalists and the number of finalists that we'll bring to campus. So Karen can send out some dates, yeah. some holds on your calendars too. And that's what we plan to do. But I think it's important. I think people have a couple of questions have been coming in about, you know, how much time would I spend on the sort of given days, right? Yeah, Armando's going. So I think that's so the all day meeting for the semifinals on the twenty sixth. That really is probably an all day meeting. I mean, relative, you know, a, a, like a nine to five kind of thing, um, yeah. where we would be going through it. everybody that's. Um, um, nominated or has put or has finished an application for the presidential search, and we—that's the paper cut day where we would be where we would be making our decision about the semifinalist. Um, the semifinalist again, so that meeting will be virtual. The April one through 
3rd. The semifinalist interviews will be virtual. We have the three days reserved again. Um, I'm kind of thinking that it might be half a day on that Saturday, but it really does depend too on the energy level of the committee. I don't want to be making those kind of conversations about who would we be bringing onto campus, um, our finalist interviews at the end of a really long day. It might be that we need to come back that Saturday morning and you know say, here's where we left the conversation. Now we're ready to make the decision about who we're going to bring to campus. Um, so to give us you know plenty of time to be able to um, have conversations where we're not um, zoomed out, lots of fatigue. Um, and so again, those would be virtual. Um, the April uh, 12th through 23rd, the, the bringing the finalists to campus, we are envisioning this to be a very high, a hybrid um, um, way. So we would ask the finalists to come to campus we would provide, um, we're thinking that these four, that the, the interviews with whomever we decide that these candidates should be meeting with, that there will be a both in-person and virtual opportunity for people who are engaging in those interviews. Um, and um, we would work with our campus counterparts on what those rooms would, would be, where that would be so that we have the most flexibility. Um, we know that we're planning for a forum, an open forum, where the candidates will be addressing um, campus and the public. Um, and again, we envision that to be in a hybrid fashion where, you know, we are taking into consideration the number of people who can gather responsibly, finding a space that allows for that, along with the opportunity for people to um, um, be part of that forum in a virtual, in a virtual way. Um, Let's see, we, I, we have some other, you know, again, some subcommittee work that needs to be done um, in order to make all of this, this work, but maybe we'll take questions and comments first before I go into the um, subcommittee work that I think needs to be done. Yes. Or Armando, John, I see your hand up and then Ali, and then Liz. Yes, thank you for putting this draft together. Uh, my question is, if you have any idea at this point of what time these meetings would take place, uh, uh, of course, the all-day meeting, it's okay. As some, some of these dates uh, for us, for instance, that we teach, and then I, may, I need to make arrangements, and there's several classes here. So, but in, in case of how... <laughs> how soon we could have an idea of the time of the day, is that mornings, is that the you know, late afternoons, is that lunch hour? I, I don't know. And a second question, if you don't mind, when the finalists are on campus, we should all follow all their activities or their specific activities that committee members should be? Yeah, I think that that's a more reasonable thing for when the candidates are on campus, that you won't be, requ you won't be required to see, be at every single one of those meetings. They'll be meeting with different groups of people on campus. And we would envision that because we're gonna be doing this in a hybrid fashion, candidates aren't gonna be moved from place to place necessarily. Um, but they do. we do want to have a presence, I think, of, a, of somebody from the committee when the group that they're meeting with is especially part of the, of, the, of the group that you might be representing, right? And even, I think it'll be good to even virtually um, escort people from meeting to meeting. And that to me is part of the, the, the committee's responsibility. But no, you wouldn't be re you wouldn't be required to, you know, beginning at nine o'clock until, you know, the evening when they've had maybe their forum to be present at every single one of those activities. There's enough of us on the committee that we're going to be able to cover being with the candidate as needed, that we don't all have to be there um, from start to finish every day. But we will have designated times for the committee to meet with the candidates. Okay, so that, that would be your one obligation um, and then to attend the forums. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ali, you, you have your hand up as well? Yeah, so I have a, just a couple of questions um, with relation to this. And that is, the, the first is, um, Rightly or wrongly, sometimes people have a perception that the order of the candidates coming in reflects the order of preference. Um, is there going to be a guide as to how um, the order of finalists is being selected, or is it just based on availability, and will that be clearly communicated? 
Um, that's my part one question. And then my part two question is that in the previous search, we scheduled public forums in Iowa Memorial Union for people to, or for the candidates to um, give a presentation to the, the entire community with uh, a follow-up at the end of their presentations with questions and answers from the broader community. And is there a plan on how to facilitate that in this new setting? Yeah, yeah. So Ali, um, um, my understanding is that we would be bringing in candidates according to their availability. And, you know, Janice and Rod and Jim, if you have other comments to make, but that's that that's that that's my that that would be my plan is according to their availability. Um, we will be putting a group together to strategize on the logistics of how we would conduct an open forum because that's very much a part of what we want to do is to have the candidates address campus and the community and give those people time to um, ask questions of the candidate. So, you know, again, I think Jim and Janice and Rod have had experience in that virtual format and how do you do that? We'll be relying on them on how to pull that off. Jim or John and I envision again, that to be a hybrid situation, again, given people's level of comfort in being in those kinds of venues, but making the venues large enough so that people who could be in person can be in person but again, you know, we have to um, adhere to the campus guidelines of how big our, our gatherings can be. So we would ha definitely have to figure out a mechanism for, you know, you know, um, you know how, many, how many seats are open to certain people if it's an in-person, uh, you know, an in-person, if there's an option for an in-person component to this, and then what would that virtual component look like? So, so, yeah. so Sandy, if I could add a comment to yours, I this is really an important question and I'm so happy it came up. Yeah. When you get to the point of both your semi-finalists and your finalists, one of the reasons that we strongly suggest unranked is exactly for the point that you just made. All eight are equal or X number, whatever that number is for your semi-finalists. If you have three, four, whatever number it is for finalists, they're all unranked. So it's important for us as a group to refer to them simply as candidates at that point. So, so they're not gonna be ranked in any order and uh, Sandy was absolutely right. It depends on the availability of the individuals in terms of how they're scheduled. But you know, because you're first doesn't mean you were highest ranked or because you're last doesn't mean, doesn't mean you were lower ranked. Just means that, it just means that's when we could organize the schedule. That's very, very important that once it reaches this point of semi-finalists and finalists, they are unranked. And, and I might add something, typically you charge us with informing those semi-finalists that either they've been selected to move forward or they have not. So it will be in that communication, that letter that they will um, be, be told who to contact. True, true with, uh, true with semifinals also, but they're told who to contact um, uh, to, to establish the, the, their interview day and date and time. So that further substantiates the idea that um, there will be no ranking. And then first Janice, come, first served. Janice, when it comes to scheduling, um, you know, it's going to be really critical that they are brought in in quick sequence so that there isn't a long gap between one candidate and another. Um, it, it, is that going to be the responsibility of the search firm to convey the importance of uh, availability of what are otherwise very busy individuals to make sure that they can make this timeline? They, they will already know when they're identified as uh, semi-finalists, the candidates at that point, they will know the dates that they have to have available. Is that what you mean? And we yeah. also tell them they have to respond immediately. They have to let us know. Yes, I'm going to accept this invitation to go go forward, and uh, and I will get in touch with someone right away. I think Liz has a question. I'll come back. Yes, Liz, you're many, next many on the, the, the questions, please. Many, many of the candidates that we've been talking to uh, have already inquired about the timeline. While we didn't give them an exact date, we did put this in a framework to say mm -hmm. the committee wants to move fairly quickly after the March 15th deadline. So uh, to underscore Janice's point, uh, they will know at the point where they're identified as semi-finalists, 
that they need to be thinking about reserving the dates that you have identified for the finalist interview mm -hmm. so that if they are selected, they will have already started to think about how they can clear their calendar to, to, you know, to, to uh, adjust to those dates. I concur with you. We need to move this pretty quickly after the folks have been identified as semi-finalists and once they become finalists so that this process keeps moving forward. Yeah, it's always a big concern if there's a gap between one candidate and another that stretches Agreed. out the process. Agreed. No, the, the, your schedule, the one that you you established will yes. should, should take care of that. Could I ask one question about the, the, about the open forum, um, whatever format? Will you be asking us to convey to each individual uh, the, a, a common question that they should be um, addressing? You know, we haven't, we haven't talked about that yet, Janice, but yeah, that's something that the committee is going to have to consider. Do we want them to address a common question, a theme, a presentation? What is it that we want them to do that every candidate does? Yeah. And in the previous search, what we did do for every candidate was to have a theme that they needed to address or a statement. And we gave the same thing to everyone. And there, But there was a great deal of latitude and flexibility in how they answered the the, the, that that introductory statement, but it was something that we did provide to them. So if, um, John and Sandra, I, I think that that's something that we'll need to work together collectively with your leadership to come yep. together and, and have. Agree, agree. Okay. Thank you, Ali. Liz, you've been waiting patiently for your question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was just curious how the groups would be identified for on-campus interviews and if a decision mm -hmm. has been made on who those groups will be. No, in fact, we have, so that's a really good question. We, so John and I have been sort of thinking about this, what's the work to be done and how would we divide and conquer? So um, the, so there's some things that we need to happen, right? Uh, we need to do a candidate evaluation pool, or tool. So when we're evaluating our semi-finalists, um, semi we need a tool that we use consistently to evaluate and decide, you know, again, um, how do we, how do we make our decision to get to the finalist? And so for those of you who've done your bias training, um, um, you the, the university has some tools that they've already um, started to, to develop to help during Dean searches and other um, higher level searches on campus. So um, I'm gonna lead that committee and ask, again, we'll kind of do a doodle pool for this, you know, three, four or five other um, committee members to help with that evaluation tool. The other is the campus interview schedule. Um, so Liz, to your point, um, how, what will that, who are the people on campus we want these candidates to be meeting with? Um, and maybe to that committee can look at, um, uh, the, the, the topic or question or whatever it is they want those um, finalists to be addressing during that open forum. So John Keller is gonna lead that. And again, we'll ask for you know three, four, five committee members to help with that um, activity. And then the other one is the um, campus feedback. So we also have to come up with a tool to elicit feedback from campus. And we wanna be able to do that again systematically and um, we've asked Ali to lead a group to do that. So those are you know, three big areas that we know that committee members are gonna need to um, start working on. Um, and the fourth is the logistics. So exactly how would we, um, you know, what's this hybrid environment gonna look like? What will the evening um, time be for candidates? How are we gonna showcase the campus to, to people? Um, um, so we've, I've asked, um, John and I have asked uh, Laura McLaren to lead a, uh, that, that sort of campus support, the logistics and the moving people from place to place and um, how would, again, how would we get rooms ready? What are the best rooms on campus to use if we're in a hybrid situation? What would an open forum look like and how would we, um, how would we manage that? And then just one other question, the April 30th will be the, that's a hard and fast deadline when someone will be selected correct i'm just making sure i'm reading that correctly okay. yes yes okay. this is connor could anything adjust that timeline like if we get to march 15th and there's not you know maybe the search firm is like we don't have enough applications any projection on that yeah, you know, kind of that's the one thing that we've said from the very beginning, if we get to the point where that, you know what, the pool just doesn't look like the pool that we want, that changes that deadline for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we're hoping that's not the case, Connor, but as you <laughs> might expect. <laughs> and I, 
I'm not a betting man very often, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet that uh, that will not be the case, but you know, I, I've, I've been wrong before. Um, so. Okay. Sandy, is this the, is this the point when we're asking to ask people to, uh, again, um, offer their services on these little subcommittees to help us keep moving yeah. things forward? Yeah, I think I think we'll have Karen do a doodle pool again and have people sign up. That works really well. And then, you know, give people some time to think about it. And again, you know, we're, we're a big enough committee and realize that people are busy. So, um, you know, if, if, if you don't have time to do those things right now, don't, don't worry about people. Yeah. Again, we work as a team and we will be reporting back to one another on as we accomplish our um, goals for these subcommittees, so. Okay. Okay. Could you clarify um, which of these meetings will be um, closed to the committee only? I, I think I know the answer to that, but I'd just like some clarification. Yeah, Amy, do you wanna? Sure, yeah. sure. So it's, sorry, I've got my glasses on, but I am I still have terrible vision. It will be the paper cut on the 26th of March, the semifinalist interviews um, on April 1st through 3rd, and then when the committee meets on April 28th to do its final evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses of the candidates, that will also be in closed session. And then when the committee meets with the board to present its final evaluation on either the 29th or the 30th, that will be in closed session. Okay, great. Thank you, Amy, for that clarification. Appreciate your uh, counsel on that. Is there an activity that we didn't plan for or a group that we, a group that we didn't think about, you guys? I do see your, your hand, Heather. If you think of something, let us know. These were sort of, you know, again, the work we envision that needs to be done. And again, I think because we don't have the opportunity to meet person to person, forming these subcommittees and getting people involved into the sort of, you know, nuts and bolts of how this is gonna happen is, is, is exactly what the committee should be doing. Sandy, uh, Jim, I have a question. Uh, are you going to invite the spouse or significant other? And if you do, uh, who will kind of worry about supporting that person? And uh, depending on the circumstances, there might be some questions about uh, child care or something yeah. that the uh, in individual might want to ask about. Yeah. So that's just something we shouldn't forget. Right, Jim. I, and so we've, we've talked about that. And, and um, I think, again, on our logistics side with Laura McLaren, um, if people want to bring their spouses to campus and we need to make arrangements for that, um, that we'll, we'll talk about in that logistics subcommittee about how to handle that. You know, who's, on, who's the point person on campus to make, you know, to help with us accommodate the spouse. And, and Jim, just to add, um, in the past, we have um, precedent and mechanisms already in place for how we handle that. And um, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty robust and it takes care of the uh, significant other in terms of having a defined schedule for them as well. Yeah. Separate from this. Yeah, it's a pretty usual thing on campus. Yeah. Heather. Great, uh, this is Heather. I would like to ask potentially our AS, um, AGB partners how things look on the back end right now, or um, you know, are they seeing a lot of traffic, or what process are they currently going through with the anticipation of us um, having an opportunity to look at those applicants? So, at what time do they do their you know reference checks, or what time you know how things look from their end? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll give that a start since you just mentioned reference checks. Once uh, the semifinalist candidates are identified, six, seven, eight, then we start reference checking as long as they give us permission to do so. They must do that in writing. Um, so we have a kind of tight period to do that. 
And um, on the day that you sit all day and, and uh, no, the next, at, at the meeting at which you determine after um, your interviews of the semifinalists, then we will, um, and finalists are identified. That's when we will do, I'm staying on track with what you just asked. That's when we will um, do the deeper background check. We'll start that process and um, do some off list checking also. Something I wanted to say, yeah. Uh, well, you might need, need to build in the time for these little reports on reference checks too. So that might have to be built into probably the day of the semifinalist interviews. So you might want to do them after the first day or all together or immediately following the interview. Depends on what makes sense. Can you, can you, um... mm -hmm. So once the so once we have uh, the the once once we're closed and you op open the portal, I think that's the right word <laughs> for us to be able to look at the materials. Can you share with the committee sort of what 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 that is, or you know how you know are people given passwords? What 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 happens when that that's open to allow people to get in to see the the materials? Um, there will be a, a very clear sheet of instruction shared with you. But um, the, a committee, the committee has a password. And once you use that password as committee login, you will see the um, number of, of completed applications. Uh, that, that number will be in order of receipt. Uh, there's, there's no uh, numbering uh, with, with in preference or rank, a ranking. Uh, so number one is the first completed application we received. Uh, in, in the file, you will see, um, um, the folder for that completed application, and it will include the important cover letter, that cover statement that uh, Sandy mentioned earlier. Uh, there will be the resume, and there will be the list of references. Uh, we certainly do not touch those references. It's always interesting to see who people choose, but there, there will be no calling of references or contact of any, any kind until we're given permission to do that by the person identified as a semifinalist. Um, that site also will include um, reminders for you. There will be a, a folder called committee documents. And in that folder, you will see um, a, a nice summary of, of all of the applicants, just as a reminder uh, of who they are and from where they come. Uh, that might help as you go through all of the uh, um, applications. Uh, we will also suggest an easy way, uh, a simple matrix with three columns of uh, yes, maybe, and no with your immediate reaction. Um, and then once you sit down and decide to go over all of the, and go over all of the applications all together, um, there may be a nice common set of no's that yeah. um, no one needs to really look at. Uh, anything else, Rod or Jim? I think that's good. I just have a follow up to Heather's question, which is uh -huh. related to the reference checking. Um, when you do your due diligence on off reference checking, and if any red flags, behavioral issues, legal issues, things like that come up, how does that get communicated to the committee in a way that is consistent with the rules. Um, you know, that this is about protecting the, the university uh, from any potential uh, candidates that we shouldn't be having. Mm. You said consistent with the rules. Consistent, so, right, because, it, you know, my, yeah. my understanding, for an example, is that as a committee, we can't ask certain questions and we yeah, can't yeah. do yeah. certain digging that you, you can. Um, I see. Well, Typically when we find a, a red flag, which may emerge with an off-list reference or it may come up with um, internet research, um, we inform the, the co-chairs of that. And it, this is Amy from the board office. My experience has been that those off-reference checks um, aren't likely to capture any of the uh, protected class information that I think your question is speaking to. Um, and then mm -hmm. as we've done in the past, Jim and Janice would uh, share um, the items, not the protected status information with you verbally. Okay. Okay. Anjali, you have a question? Yeah, um, as I was looking at these dates and, and maybe you said this, so I apologize, but just for clarification, 
Um, between April 1st and 3rd is when we're going to do the virtual semifinalist interviews. Are we going to meet during that time to decide who the finalists will be, or is there a meeting that's going to happen after April 3rd to decide the finalists? Again, depending upon how things unfold, I think what Sandy and I are envisioning is that we would do um, those interviews on that Thursday, Friday, and maybe part of Saturday morning, depending upon the numbers again. But probably at some point on the Saturday, April 3rd, would be when we would um, then want to meet as a committee to determine um, who the finalists will be and the number of finalists. So Excellent. while things are fresh in our minds, but not, not like immediately after, you know, an eight hour day of interviewing people, you know, we, we, we need to be fresh, but not, not, you know, exhausted through the interview process on terms of, um, you know, having honest conversations about who the finalist should be. So we would anticipate, I, I mean, personally, again, I don't know what the number is going to be, but I'm anticipating all three of those days being used uh, as effectively as possible, either with interviews with the semifinalists and then um, a committee meeting to determine out of those interviews who the finalist should be. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Of course. I would like to add one more comment um, as we're um, getting close to the hour. And again, I'm not trying to stifle any conversation whatsoever, but we are, um, we, again, I wanna remind everybody that at the beginning of this process, we signed confidentiality statements um, and this is uh, never um, even, you know, it, certainly even more important now as we're beginning the phase of um, looking, you know, in a couple of weeks, looking at candidates' uh, application materials. We're going to learn who, who the applicants are. And it's an absolutely critical period of time when confidentiality is maintained through this whole process. So I, I want to remind everyone of that particular um, restriction or privilege that we have that we need to maintain uh, confidentiality now through the end of this process here coming up in the next month and a half or two months. <clears throat> okay, so I, I know you're going to need to sit with some of this too for a bit. So any questions that you have or that we can convey um, to our search our search partners, you know, let us know and we'll, you know, make sure that everyone on the committee has um, access to the question and to the answer that's given so that, you know, we all are on the same page as we move forward. Um, I'm gonna ask if there's any other business to come before the committee before we close. Yes, yeah, Sandy and John, is this an okay time for me to mention an item from the floor? Absolutely. Yes, please, David. Yeah, so I, I wanted to share some feedback that I've received in my capacity as a member of the AAUP, which is the American Association of University Professors, and as a member of the UI uh, CLA, Liberal Arts and Sciences Executive Committee. Uh, I think that it's important feedback for our committee to consider, and, and given the microscope that we're under, I, I think that it's good that our committee be able to say that we considered it. Uh, so some faculty have expressed a concern that stems largely, I think, from the 2015 search which is still raw for, for very many folks. Uh, the main concern is that the ideal candidate language in the job ad leaves open a, a loophole. This is how the concern was expressed to me. Uh, leaves open a loophole whereby a candidate without a PhD or terminal degree and without significant experience in higher ed will make the initial shortlist and or be appointed. Uh, I did the best I could to respond to the concern, but, uh, for example, by pointing out that the very last attribute listed in the ad is earn doctorate or terminal degree from an accredited institution of higher education. But the second to last item is a preferred experience in connection with an academic medical center. I tried to point out, for example, that the earn doctorate or terminal degree language is clearly being given a very high level of priority when it's contrasted with the preferred language that modifies the attribute that comes just before, even though both attributes, of course, are extremely important. Uh, the response to all of that was still one of concern because none of the attributes is required. And so I just wanted to share that feedback with the committee. Uh, so other thoughts? I mean, you know, what I, what I can say is that um, this job description and the desired attributes, I believe the whole committee is, uh, there's consensus that 
these are the things that we're looking for. And I believe we're all on the same page about that. So as of now, um, everything that I've seen in the process, including the work by the co-chairs and the search firm indicates that we're on track to um, recruit somebody that meets the definitions that we as a committee have collectively come together and um, put together this description on. Other comments? Thank you, Ali. Yes. So, um, you know, I'll address this as well. I think that our, that the leadership attributes that we came up with, again, and I made this comment earlier in the meeting, come directly from the listening visits. And again, we had 16 of those. And I think the committee, as well as our search um, partners, um, did a absolutely outstanding job of reflecting what we heard in the listening visits. visits. And it's very clear to us that we are um, um, entering this search process with, with the goal and with the mandate really from, from what we heard of hiring somebody that has academic credentials and knows about running a university has had a life at a university setting and has a terminal degree. And I don't hear anything from anybody else countering that thought process or what we've done um, to have, you know, again, this reflect what we heard from our listening sessions. It's reflected in the leadership characteristics that we expect to see, that these are expectations with one, um, one of these bullet points as being a preferred everything else being an expectation and the de degree to which these candidates um, meet these expectations are what, what we are being charged with teasing out. Not that they will not have them, but the degree to which they possess these. Yes. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate your, your views, which I concur with. And you and I have chatted about that, but yeah, I concur with what you just mentioned. I would all, uh, you know, I, I, I'd also say as a member of the last search committee that um, I don't believe that the issues that campus had with the search were related to the description, but more to do with process. Yeah. Yeah. Any other feedback or comments? David, thank you for bringing this to the committee. Yes. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so we'll close then. And I, again, I will just, um, you know. Kay has her hand raised. Oh, sorry, Kay. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, thank you. Picking up on what David said and Ali has said, some direct input that I've gotten is that um, the public or this, these, this audience was very aware of the steps we've taken to have a very open process. And I've, um, I've reiterated that and they, they've said there was nothing wrong with the process. It was how the decision was ultimately made. So could you remind all of us what happens in those final days of April? Does the committee make our recommendation and how does the, how does the Board of Regents respond to that? What is their um, opportunity to make a, di a different decision than our recommendation? Yeah, so we are not recommended who the pre who they who they select we are we are taking the finalists and we are coming up with a list of um, positive attributes and concerns that we have and we're making them known to the board of regents so that they may select the president again that's the board of regents purview um, our attitude should be i think as a committee that people we bring into onto campus as finalists we should feel very comfortable that any one of those people could be president. And so we're not experimenting here. We're saying these people were good enough to bring to campus because we believe that they could also be a president of our university. And here are the things that we think are, again, positive attributes, maybe some things that we might have concerned, but you know where they are in each of those things is, um, maybe different, maybe really very much the same. And our hope is that it's gonna be a very difficult decision for the Board of Regents to make. Yeah, I, I'd also reiterate uh, in a different uh, way, the same thing that 
we are a search committee, not a selection committee. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that we even say for faculty searches. Right, correct. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a great point, Ali. Thank you so much. I, this is Heather again. I do have a question to that. Um, so we have Board of Regent members on here. Will they be reporting back to the Board of Regents or will these candidates have an opportunity to meet with the Board of Regents as a whole? The candidates meet with the Board of Regents. Okay, that's part of the process. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Yes, and Heather, that that uh, that next step of the candidates meeting with the board will occur on um, well, it depends on how things unfold as we get closer to the dates, either um, April 29th or April 30th. Okay, It'll be one of the last steps, and then the board will go from there and making their their uh, selection and appointment. Anything else? All right, so I will just reiterate what John said at the beginning of the meeting. Um, we very much appreciate the work that the committee is doing and the strong work that came out of the subcommittees for the uh, set of um, interview questions. And um, I'm looking forward to the next couple of months. I think it's gonna be exciting. And, um, you know, this is a, this is a hugely 